This is CBC Winnipeg News. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Three 17-year-old hockey players from a southern Manitoba high school team have been arrested over allegations including sexual assault. The charges stem from two alleged hazing incidents. CBC's Cameron McIntosh has our top story. RCMP are calling these hazing incidents, saying that three 17-year-old male hockey players were all arrested from the same high school hockey team in southern Manitoba. Now, two of those players were arrested for sexual assault, sexual assault with a weapon, and forcible confinement. The other one was arrested for assault and sexual assault. Police say the victims were five rookies on that same hockey team between the ages of 15 and 16. Police allege that these incidents took place in two trips to Winnipeg in November 2023 and January 2024 and happened in Winnipeg hotels as the team visited the city for a hockey tournament. It really should be a message to everybody uh, who's involved in sports or youth sports that uh, incidents like this are, are not okay and it's okay to speak up for yourself and to come forward, whether that's uh, you feeling um, strong enough to do it yourself or, or going to somebody else that you trust that can help you um, report these incidents. Because of the nature of the allegations, we're not naming the team to protect the victims. Also, because the accused are minors, we can't name them. Now, both Hockey Canada and Hockey Manitoba have explicit rules banning hazing, but Advocates for Safe Sports says when it comes to setting up a culture that condemns harassment or bullying, it's really up to the teams themselves. The message is clear. It's not allowed. If police have to get involved, they will, but the organizations, parents and coaches need to be on the same page in terms of sending that message. Well, these allegations first came to light earlier this year. The team was withdrawn from the Manitoba High School hockey playoffs. The Manitoba High School Athletics Association is calling these allegations deeply disturbing. The team is made up of players from a few different schools. The RCMP say they've spoken to the schools, the Prairie Spirit School Division and the coaches of the team. The three accused have a court date in early June. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Rural emergency departments across the province were closed last year for tens of thousands of hours. That's according to new data from the province obtained and analyzed by CBC News. As Josh Crabb reports, it's leading to uncertainty and anxiety for rural residents. In the bustling interlake community of Arburg, there's a buzz on the street as residents run errands. We went there to talk to people about their emergency department. Mom of two, Caitlin Chorney, stopped to share her thoughts. Tell us about the ER services here. There is none. I've had to go to Gimli, I've had to go to Stonewall. Uh, I personally had to go to Selkirk. The ER was closed during our visit, as it was for most of 2023. Mayor Peter Duick lives right across the street and is reminded every time he walks out his front door. If you zoom in on the sign there, you'll see um, emergency services not available today. That sign seems to be out there almost 30 days every month. And uh, that is a problem for the community. Arburg isn't alone. Across Manitoba last year, rural emergency departments were shut down for more than 80,000 hours, the equivalent of about 3,300 days. I'm, I'm shocked that the number is that high when you put it in those terms, in the number of days and the number of hours. Dr. Nichelle Desilet is a rural family and emergency physician in Nipawa and board director with Doctors Manitoba. She says when ERs are closed, that's time patients and their families are left living with uncertainty. When their local emergency room is closed, I'm sure it's stressful to think, what if I'm feeling unwell this weekend? Where am I going to go? Staffing shortages are plaguing ERs across Manitoba. Four ERs closed their doors indefinitely last year after struggling to stay open. Leaf Rapids was last open in July 2022. Carberry's ER shut down in the summer. Melita and Morris closed September 1st. Arburg's ER stopped taking patients November 6th after shutting down 72 other times in the year. It had the second longest total closure in the province. The Interlake Eastern Regional Health Authority says people in the Arburg area having a health emergency should call 911 to be taken to a different ER. The closest one is in Gimli. That's a 30-minute drive from Arburg. 
Selkirk is an hour away. That's where most people go. It's a trip the mayor says most people make by car rather than calling an ambulance. Duick says many worry they'll have to wait for an ambulance. It's only a matter of when, not if, someone is going to need the ambulance and it will be an hour out of town. Manitoba Health Minister Uzoma Asaguera says the government is committed to rural health and rebuilding relationships with doctors and nurses. But Manitoba emergency physician Dr. Alex Chachinoff says an ER that's open off and on isn't really an ER. While many towns feel they need one to be safe, it's not always possible. You want to be uh, transported to the best place for you. And it's impossible to have 50 or 70 best places. And he argues patients can get better care at ERs in larger centres. Josh Crabb, CBC News, Arburg. Manitoba Progressive Conservatives will choose a new leader on April 25th. Just not this April 25th. As CBC's Bartley Kives reports, the PCs are waiting a year to choose a permanent successor to former leader Heather Stephenson. This MLA and this MLA and this former MLA and this rural Manitoba mayor are all interested in running for PC leader. Hi, everyone. Heather Stephenson resigned in January, and the party has new rules for a leadership race that will take place on April 25th, 2025. Brad Zander, the chair of the PC Leadership Committee, says the long lead time should allow the Tories to sign up more members. Just to give potential candidates the chance to really get out there and engage with as many Manitobans as possible, um, and so a longer period of time provides that opportunity. The extra time also gives the PCs a chance to raise money. The party ended up with an $850,000 deficit at the end of the 2023 election campaign. That campaign ended in a loss to Wab Canoes NDP. Nonetheless, four potential candidates are already in the mix, including Fort White MLA Abi Khan, who says he'll make a decision about running very soon. A robust leadership is something that we desperately need in the Conservative Party and in all politics. It's always good to have a uh, leadership race. Former Crookfield Park MLA Kevin Klein, who lost his seat last fall, says he is very likely running. Hardy's in a position where it needs to rebuild from the ground up. I still believe in common sense government. I still believe that we uh, we can achieve a common sense government in Manitoba. Carla Devlin, the mayor of East St. Paul, says she may throw her hat to the ring. Manitoba has great opportunities and we just need to have some good leadership in these roles and bring the party together and make some success happen in Manitoba. Interim PC leader Wayne Wasco also won't rule out a run. Not to be coy or anything else. My job right now is, is, uh, is representing our PC caucus as interim leader. There is nothing preventing the interim leader from running, but there are new rules in this race. The most significant, the longer campaign period. It can start as soon as this June or as late as January. The PC Leadership Committee will decide in May when this race will formally start. Bartley Kivas, CBC News, Winnipeg. The 2024 federal budget has been officially delivered and there aren't many surprises. The government had already announced several programs, but the big question was how they'd be paid for. CBC's Rafi Bujakanian reports. Mr. Speaker, we are acting today to ensure fairness for every generation. With multiple announcements over the course of weeks aimed at addressing Canada's housing crisis, the government has revealed how it plans to pay. To responsibly build a fairer future for younger Canadians, we need to make sure our tax system is fairer. That means going after capital gains, like the sale of a secondary home for the country's wealthiest and corporations. Individuals to pay taxes on two-thirds of anything they make above $250,000 a year. Businesses fully moving to that rate. This new revenue will help make life cost less for millions of Canadians, particularly millennials and Gen Z. 
Support for the Liberals with that demographic has plummeted in opinion polls. The $23 billion housing program in this budget hopes to win them back. $8 billion of that in spending, the rest in loans. Ottawa even wants to convert some underused Canada post and military public land into housing and spend up to $500 million to buy unused public land from provinces or cities. For this observer, an obvious play. Targeting the main political areas, I think, that are really challenges government, like, like housing and affordability, might not even be in their jurisdiction, but they're responding to the need for action by Canadians. Certainly the text emphasizes uh, the demographic that's, I think, become a little distant from this government. But to even get there, the minority Liberals need opposition help to pass the budget, and it's not clear they'll have any. This is the ninth deficit. The ninth deficit after the Prime Minister promised the budget would balance itself. Conservatives will vote against this wasteful inflationary budget. We have some serious concerns, and I want to hear from the Prime Minister what his plan is to address those concerns. With surveys also showing concerns over too much spending, the government does not want to increase its $40 billion deficit this year. This may not be the last pre-election budget the Liberals are planning, but they are banking on it, paying off for them at the polls. Rafi Bujikan, Young CBC News, Ottawa. I'm Ian Fraze at the Manitoba Legislature, where Finance Minister Adrian Sanla offered a quick reaction to the federal budget released Tuesday afternoon. Sala says it's early. He hasn't been able to pour over all the documents, but he says the multi-billion dollar housing program sounds encouraging. He says it builds upon Manitoba's efforts, like a plan to remove the PST off of rental unit construction. With the housing announcements that we made in our budget, there's a great opportunity here to see uh, opportunities to stack uh, uh, some of these uh, federal announcements with what we announced recently, and that should help uh, Manitobans to get access to more affordable housing. Sala also likes that Ottawa will make clean energy grants available this year. He says that will help organizations like Manitoba Hydro to advance green initiatives. At City Hall, Winnipeg Mayor Scott Gillingham is hopeful new infrastructure money can be used to upgrade the North End water treatment plant. I have asked the federal government before that they permit uh, some flexibility when it comes to funding so that any new envelope of funding that they would roll out could be used to stack on previous uh, funding granted. What I'd like to see, frankly, is us as a council identify a portion of that $1 billion that goes to municipalities to try to access as much of it as we can and to apply it, allocate it to the North End plant. Meanwhile, Sala says infrastructure is where this budget falls short. Premiers from across the country have been asking for more infrastructure dollars for months. Ian Fraze, CBC News, Winnipeg. Manitoba's advocate for children and youth is sounding the alarm over rising addictions in youth and the services that aren't meeting their needs. The advocate's office is demanding more resources and support from the province. The CBC's Rosanna Hempel reports. Manitoba's advocate for children and youth says youth addiction services are in crisis. Sherry God is speaking out because her office has seen a surge in cases linked to addictions. Many identified substance use as a, main, as a means to cope with their life circumstances, whether that be mental health, family issues, lack of recreational opportunities, painful life experiences. In 2018-2019, only a handful, 3% of the office's advocacy cases were linked to addictions. In 2022-2023, that number jumped to 22%. Gott says female and Indigenous youth are overrepresented in those affected, and many don't know where to turn for help. Some are losing their lives. In fact, she says from 2018 to 2023, her office found 56 youth deaths involved overdoses or other circumstances amplified by drugs or alcohol. Gott says the options for help are limited. There are long wait lists and some supports too far from home. I'm hoping that the government steps up and provides that support that's needed for our youth. I'm hoping that they see that there is a crisis in the system. Manitoba's Minister of Families says the NDP have considered it a crisis for years. 
we have been taking this issue very seriously from when we were in opposition. And certainly now that we're in government, we take it even more seriously and we're working together and we've put in measures to attempt to start dealing with this in a, in a comprehensive and holistic manner across government. Now, Honey Fontaine says some of those measures include funding for addictions and youth services and a provincial suicide prevention strategy. Local nonprofit Marymount welcomes the advocates' call to action, but Executive Director Nancy Parker says other reports have called for the same thing. In the meantime, she says the challenges have only gotten worse. If you're a family member whose youth is struggling or even close to dying with suicide and overdose and all these really complex challenges, it's heartbreaking. The advocate says collaboration and a strategy will be key. The province says it is committed to working with the advocate's office. Rosanna Hempel, CBC News, Winnipeg. A longtime Winnipeg business owner says he's frustrated after his store was broken into for the third time in six months. Overnight, thieves smashed into Joe Daly's sports and framing on St. Mary's Road. Owner Travis Daly says they were last hit in February. Since then, they've hired security guards for outside the store overnight, but thieves broke in before they arrived. Daly says they made off with thousands of dollars of merchandise, including signed jerseys, some worth up to $1,200 a piece. It's left him questioning whether staying in business after 35 years is still worth it. It's just very disheartening to you know, to have to deal with this as a small business. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, I always consider us very tiny in terms of business and to have to continuously deal with this, the costs involved and the, the headaches involved, the repairs involved, it, it starts to wear you down. A Winnipeg senior is questioning the value of buying flight cancellation insurance after his claim was denied. CBC's Caroline Bargut reports. Last December, James Parker bought two WestJet tickets to Calgary so that he and his wife could visit relatives in January. While on the airline's website, he clicked on a box to purchase cancellation insurance just in case. It was $117, I think, something like that. I said, it's, it gives me a little bit of peace of mind. A few weeks later, he learned his relative's condo was flooded, which meant Parker and his wife couldn't stay in the building. The 78-year-old cancelled their tickets and submitted a claim for a refund to Alliance Global, the travel insurance company. They were denied. That's because a disaster at a pre-booked destination accommodation is not listed as a covered reason under their policy. And if it's not listed, the company will not issue a refund. In general, for prepaid travel expenses to be eligible for reimbursement under trip cancellation benefits, the reason for cancellation must be listed as a covered reason within the customer's policy of insurance, wrote Manager of Corporate Communications for Alliance Global, Taja Squire, in an email to CBC News. That didn't sit well with Parker. I understand it's a business to make money, uh, but I think there should be leeway uh, to deal with changes or, or modifications that arise because not everything can be written down, you know? I mean, it's, it's life. The Travel Health Insurance Association of Canada says policies vary, so make sure to familiarize yourself with what you are covered for before you leave on vacation. Uh, they put policies in and they price them according to the wording that they've got. So it'll cover certain things uh, in one policy, but maybe not in another. WestJet refunded the Parker seat selection, but they're still out $623 for the cancelled flights. James Parker says in the future, he'll buy travel insurance from a real person and not just tick off a box and hope he'll be covered if anything happens. Caroline Bargood, CBC News, Winnipeg. If you have a tip for our iTeam, you can call our confidential tip line at 204-788-3744 or email iteam at cbc.ca. An investigation is underway after a 12-year-old girl found a shotgun on Gimli Beach. The girl discovered the weapon over the weekend while she was helping her family clean the beach near North Lake Street and Vaughan Avenue. Police say the firearm was rusted shut and wasn't loaded. It was disassembled at the RCMP detachment. Authorities are working to determine where the gun came from and whether it's connected to any crimes.
The city of Winnipeg says garbage and debris in homeless encampments pose safety risks for residents and emergency services. CBC's Cameron McLean reports a pilot project could target some of the city's largest camps for cleanup. There are around 150 homeless encampments in Winnipeg, according to a new city report. Advocates and inner city councillors have called for the city to do regular garbage pickup at the camps, just like residences. But the report estimates weekly cleanups at each camp would cost the city $4 million a year. Main Street Project Executive Director Jamil Mahmoud says that number is likely too high. What we really need is the, the larger encampments, the places we know people are, they need a regular service, whereas smaller encampments often don't need anything or they just need a when they move on. Point Douglas Councillor Vivian Santos told the Executive Policy Committee cleaning up the camps could reduce pressure on emergency services. The needles, the explosives that are happening if we did mindful cleanups and we cleaned this up on a consistent basis, you will see a la lesser calls for services to the Winnipeg Fire Paramedics and Winnipeg Police. The report notes there are challenges to doing the cleanups. Camp residents may mistrust city staff who might have trouble distinguishing between garbage and personal property. But Tessa Blakey Whitecloud, CEO of Silo Mission, says camp residents can help. There is a keen keen desire of the residents of encampments to have a clean space, to live in a clean space, to take care of the space that they're living. Mayor Gillingham says the goal is to move people out of camps and into housing, but he acknowledged that more needs to be done to clean up the camps. The committee passed a motion to create a pilot project targeting the largest camps in the city. Main Street Project, Silo Mission and the Downtown Community Safety Partnership will take the lead. Pending council approval, it will have a budget of $170,000 using existing departmental funding. We need encampments cleaned up. The residents of Winnipeg need encampments cleaned up. The people who are living in the encampments right now, um, they need areas cleaned up for their own sake as well. The exact number and locations of the camps targeted for cleanup has yet to be determined. The project will run until the end of October. Cameron McLean, CBC News, Winnipeg. Weather specialist Riley Lechak at the news desk now. And Riley, the city of Winnipeg has been doing their spring cleanup. I know they were doing it around River Heights this morning, but Mother Nature sure is helping, at least in Winnipeg, yes. with that rain. <laughs> uh, with the rain, Brittany, that, yes, we'll see continuing and even maybe some uh, snowflakes mm -hmm. in there as well. Let's uh, have a look at satellite and radar right now. And, uh, yes, uh, a lot of rain starting to fall uh, across the Red River Valley as expected, moving a little bit further to the north and to the east. And yes, if we look a little bit closer here, you can see in uh, the Duck Mountain region there, yes, radar picking that up, uh, depicting it as snow at least. But yes, we've seen quite a bit of rain back to the west through the day today, really not starting in earnest here in the Red River Valley until we got into the five o'clock hour or so this afternoon. So we are looking at a uh, considerable amount of rain coming uh, to the region through tonight. We also have a snowfall warning uh, for Thompson, uh, Nelson House, Split Lake. This region in particular in white looking at up to 30 centimeters of snow from now until Thursday, even lingering into Friday morning. Elsewhere uh, around this region, we're looking at uh, accumulations not as heavy, but certainly we will get some snow in northern Manitoba. So looking at the setup right now, this uh, is the Colorado low that I was talking about last night. The main event of that moving uh, into Manitoba as we get into the evening hours tonight into the overnight period does taper off and start to move out as we get through the day on Wednesday. And then behind that, yes, this Alberta Clipper, which is bringing snow to northern Manitoba through Wednesday. And the backside of that starts to wrap around and bring us some flurry activity as we head through the overnight period Wednesday into Thursday. Temperatures though still looking like they'll be uh, above the freezing mark for daytime highs at least but certainly the risk there for uh, some wet flurries uh, or some periods of wet snow. Greatest chance comes overnight Thursday into Friday when yes temperatures are uh, forecast to at least dip below the freezing mark and that will allow some of this to fall uh, as wet flurries uh, and wet snow, uh, most of which melting on contact because yes, we are going to see temperatures warming up as we get into the weekend at least. But uh, yeah, we are in for a little bit of the white stuff here uh, in southern Manitoba. In terms of rain to come, 
5 to 10 millimeters uh, through the southwestern part of the province, but yes, we're still in for about 15 to 25 uh, for the Red River Valley. In terms of snow, I think this forecast model is overshooting it a little bit. Uh, as mentioned, uh, 20 to 30 centimeters to the Thompson Norway House region, more like 5 to 10 back to the west. I think these numbers are a little bit unrealistic, but it uh, goes to show, uh, I think, where the bullseye is in terms of where we're looking at some of the highest accumulations. So right now in Winnipeg, 9 degrees east winds at 22 with a falling pressure right now as we get into the night tonight 15 to 25 millimeters of rain to come so we're looking at a wet night on the freezing mark in winnipeg uh, rain starts to taper off first thing in the morning uh, up to two first thing in the morning and the winds do die down a bit as we get into the afternoon looking at just some remaining scattered showers with a high of uh, seven degrees tomorrow dropping off to twos and ones with that chance of wet snow some flurries through friday and Brittany back to regularly scheduled spring as we get into the day on Sunday. I like that 13. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> Thanks for keeping an eye on those systems for us, Riley. You're welcome. Israel says it will retaliate against Iran for Saturday's massive aerial attack, but officials haven't said how and when they will strike. We'll have more on the fallout after the break.
Israel is standing firm on its promise to retaliate against Iran for Saturday's massive aerial attack. But it's unclear what that response will look like and when it will happen. CBC's Chris Brown reports. Israel's military apparently pulled this intercepted Iranian ballistic missile out of the Dead Sea, putting it on show to demonstrate how much damage it could have done. It's a dangerous escalation. Iran says it was Israel that actually fired first by killing two of its generals in a Syrian diplomatic consulate on April the 1st. And its foreign minister continues to warn if Israel retaliates, Iran's response will be immediate and severe. But before Saturday night, Iran had never directly hit Israel. And Israel's leaders are now trying to build a case simply letting it go to de-escalate, as many countries, including the United States, are urging, is not an option. On a visit with new military recruits, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu tried to connect Iran's attack to Israel's now six-month-long war against Hamas in Gaza. Iran stands behind Hamas, behind Hezbollah, he said. It's part of a much bigger system. This former Israeli diplomat says Netanyahu will do whatever is most likely to keep him in power. He will be trounced in any election, which is why he's trying to prolong the war in Gaza. Which, he, which is why he's trying to maintain a war atmosphere via Iran, because that, that postpones um, um, every, every uh, um, uh, political play. For the moment, Iran has shifted the focus off Gaza and the immense criticism Israel has faced for the destruction and suffering it's inflicted. But Alan Pincus doubts Israel can avoid Gaza for long. If Iran goes away, he gets the accolades for, for exercising your strength, but then attention goes back to Gaza. He loses. If he attacks Iran, he loses. Um, he's in a no-win situation. In Tel Aviv, people were anxious, but many also supported a reprisal against Iran. A targeted strike like that was the best move, and a continued targeted strike is the continued best move. It shows measure without overplaying a hand. I believe that if we do violence, it will uh, drag more violence, and I don't believe that we should continue doing so. Several European foreign ministers are reportedly making their way to Israel to make their case in person that Israel should consider the larger strategic issues. Chris Brown, CBC News, Jerusalem. Manitoba has the lowest inflation in the country, rising by 0.8% in March, down slightly from 09 in February. But Canada's overall inflation rate ticked up slightly last month to 2.9% from 2.8% the month before. Despite that, there's growing confidence the Bank of Canada could soon cut interest rates. Nisha Patel has more. Canadians paid more for gas last month, air transportation and restaurant meals were also more expensive. But one of the biggest drivers of inflation these days is the cost of shelter. My rent went up $700 uh, for the same same space, uh, so it's pretty frustrating to see what's happened in the last few years. It's impossible to rent an apartment unless you're a two-income household. I don't really spend money if I, if I can help it because, I, I mean, uh, things are getting tougher and I only assume they're going to get more tough, right? Rent prices climbed 8.5% compared to the same time a year ago. And the cost of interest on mortgages was up more than 25%. Still, the overall inflation rate is inching closer to the central bank's target. And officials say the trend is encouraging. Measures of core inflation did tick down again, and that does suggest that underlying inflationary pressures are continuing to ease. So uh, we continue to be moving in the right direction. The Bank of Canada could start cutting interest rates as soon as June, even before inflation gets back to 2%. But some risks remain. We can't forget what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, you know, if we do get another shock to oil prices in particular, uh, that could be, you know, that essentially throws uh, everything out the window. And economists warn that while interest rates went up quickly, it's unlikely they'll come down at the same pace. The bank is going to take its time, making sure that we're not going to see a, you know, a resurgence in especially real estate markets. Though for Canadians weighed down by the high cost of borrowing, a little relief could go a long way. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. 
This was day two of jury selection in Donald Trump's historic criminal trial in New York. The former U.S. president faces 34 charges in connection to a hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Trump maintains his innocence. Some accountant, I didn't know, marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was. And you get indicted over that? Twelve jurors and six alternates are needed. Seven jury members were chosen today, but not before the judge warned Trump against jury intimidation after he was heard talking toward a prospective juror. Trump is accused of falsifying business records to cover up a $130,000 payment to Daniels, allegedly in exchange for her silence before the 2016 presidential election about a sexual encounter with Trump a decade earlier. He's pleaded not guilty and denies any such encounter with Daniels. Team Canada has unveiled its new look for the upcoming Olympics in Paris. Canada's Olympic and Paralympic athletes will have three different uniforms to wear throughout the Summer Games. And here's Phil, who competes in breaking and is showcasing functionality through movement. The athletes will have separate outfits for the opening ceremony, their media appearances and the closing ceremony. The uniforms, designed by Canadian clothing company Lululemon, provide support for various body types and abilities. They include features like magnetic clothes zippers, pull-on loops and sensory touch guides. The convertible styles have breathable mesh and will wick away sweat to keep the athletes comfortable in Paris changing weather. The graphics highlight Canada's history and diversity with interpretations of art, architecture and nature. Well, fighting wildfires is grueling work, not just physically, but mentally. Last season was one of the worst years on record and also one of the deadliest. Coming up, how crews are prepping for what's already expected to be a tough season ahead and the toll it can take on their mental health. Stay with us.
Canada is coming off its worst wildfire season on record and one of the deadliest, where eight firefighters and contractors were killed on the job. Preparations are underway for another long, hot, dangerous summer. A group of new firefighting recruits is wrapping up their training in Alberta. Along with the physical demands, they're learning about the mental hazards that can come with the work. CBC's Julia Wong has the story. Aaron Kurd says this is where he belongs, on the front lines of the wildfire fight. I was actually watching the media uh, about last year and I saw, how, uh, I saw how the wildfires were impacting the communities here in Alberta and how it was actually impacting the rest of Canada as well. I felt like that, uh, that this could be a cause that I could uh, contribute to. Kurd, who used to be in the military, is among more than 500 people trained this season to work with helicopters, lay down equipment and respond to fires. But Kurt says he's been preparing psychologically as well. I like uh, taking my own time, really separating myself from, um, from my job sometimes if it gets really busy, and then uh, just focusing on myself and what I need to do. Last year, Canada saw its worst wildfire season in a century. Fires started early and were unrelenting. With dry conditions in Alberta, this year may be no different in the province. Because the seasons are longer and more intense, uh, it requires us to be very clear about what fatigue and cumulative fatigue looks like, be really clear about some of the mental health issues that can come as a result of working extended shifts many days throughout the entire summer. Make sure that we've got a little slack in the hose there. And mental health is one of the things instructors want recruits to be more open about. We always talk about uh, the hazard of fire behavior, slip trips, falls, the mental health hazards are equally important and we need to make sure that we're trying to get that into our everyday conversation. That's not to say the physical risks of the job have been forgotten. Eight people working on wildfires died last season, according to a report by Natural Resources Canada. We certainly are, are open in talking about the past as a learning experience. Uh, so what can we learn from those really unfortunate um, deaths, fatalities, serious injuries? For Kurd, even with all that considered, he's ready for what this season could bring. We're all very aware of what we have moving forward um, and just keeping healthy, um, keeping, our, keeping our morale up. A job that could see him working for weeks at a time, putting the lessons he's learned to the test. Julia Wong, CBC News, Hinton, Alberta. Riley is back now and Riley as this it's getting lighter out later into the mm -hmm. evening people are out walking later into the evening uh, them and their dog might need a bit of a rain jacket for yeah. the next few days. <laughs> It'll be a bit <laughs> soggy uh, for any type of uh, walking outdoor activities mm -hmm. uh, for the next few days at least in the south the north yes you might get a bit of a workout in with the shoveling. Yes. But, uh, yeah let's let's take a look at your dog walk forecast for Wednesday. Yes, we're looking at a cloudy and uh, wet start to the day. Uh, some scattered showers as we get through uh, into the rest uh, of the day uh, tomorrow. So yes, maybe not first thing in the morning, good time for a walk, waking up to two degrees in Winnipeg, getting up to seven by the time we reach the afternoon, but scattered showers on and off. And yes, count rule out maybe even a sunny break here and there through the afternoon. But yeah, a little bit of a uh, uh, I'm not calling it a full washout tomorrow. Tonight, certainly it, it likely to be a, a washout if you have any outdoor plans. Thank you, Michael, for sending this picture of Lucan. Uh, beautiful picture. If you can uh, send your pictures in, I'd love to see them. Talk back at cbc.ca is where you can send those. So looking at temperatures, and yes, looks a little bit different because there's been some issues with Environment Canada's data getting into the weather system. So uh, here's some of the numbers that I've got for you. Winnipeg at nine right now, six in Brandon, uh, also nine in Morden Winkler and Dauphin right now seeing uh, five degrees with uh, a little bit of uh, rain and some snow in the higher elevations. Five as well in Thompson on the freezing mark in Flin Flon and the Paw Island Lake at six and uh, Churchill at three degrees as we head uh, into the evening tonight. So looking at uh, how things look uh, far up in the atmosphere, uh, yes, we'll see as those two low pressure systems depart or a ridge of high pressure builds in and yes, that will allow some of this colder air to sink in as we get into Thursday, Friday. So uh, looking 
looking at sub freezing temperatures to start the day on Friday, at least that does start to retreat a bit. And we do get uh, some of that mild air uh, from uh, the Pacific Ocean start to come back a little bit further to the north. So we're looking at a warm up as we get into uh, the weekend and into early next week once again. So scattered showers tonight across uh, the west. We're looking at more of a steady rain in the Red River Valley and into the interlake temperatures tonight around freezing snow uh, through much of northern Manitoba. Thompson at minus one tonight. Uh, Lynn Lake at minus three. We'll see that snow continuing as we get through your day on Wednesday. By the time we hit the afternoon, still on the freezing mark. So some of this will be wet snow or even in some some wet rain. But uh, Futurecast at least depicting this as a snow event for northern Manitoba where we have some of those snowfall warnings and in the south. Yes, even some sunny breaks through the Brandon region through the afternoon tomorrow. Could see some of that through the Red River Valley, but uh, by large, Brittany, we're looking at scattered showers and a mainly cloudy day once again for Wednesday. Keep that umbrella handy or yes. that shovel if you're in the north. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Riley. You're welcome. Itchy eyes, runny nose, it's that time of year again. Yes, allergy season is upon us, but for many, it may feel like it's starting earlier than usual. Up next, we'll talk to an allergist about why you may already be reaching for that tissue. Stay with us.
This past weekend brought warm, sunny weather and has many Manitobans looking forward to spending more time outdoors, fixing up the yard and garden, spending weekends, camping, hiking. But if the thought of that makes you dread a runny nose, sneezing and itchy watery eyes, then you might be among the millions of people in this country with seasonal allergies. Dr. Christina Kalasinski is an allergist and works in clinical immunology and allergy clinics at HSC and the Grace Hospital. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Doctor, what causes seasonal allergies in some people? I know I'm someone that suffers from them. Well, it's uh, the immune system overreacting to things that are natural and it shouldn't, and shouldn't uh, uh, cause a reaction. So the immune system makes allergic antibodies. Normally, our immune system makes antibodies to fight infection. But in some people, and genetics may play a role, uh, their immune system makes allergic antibodies to things in the air, like the seasonal allergens. So that would be like the mold spores, uh, grass pollen, weed pollen, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, things like the ragweed, which is part of the weeds. And these allergic antibodies just uh, sit around on special cells called mouse cells in uh, places like the nose and the skin even, and in the eyes and even the lungs. And when you breathe in uh, one of those pollens, um, that uh, then causes the reaction to happen and substance called histamine is released from those mast cells. And that's what causes the symptoms. If those if that histamine is released in the nose, that's where you get the stuffy nose, the runny nose, the sneeze, the itch. If it's released in the eyes, you get the itchy, watery eyes. We're all very familiar with that. So what is it about the weather right now that is really triggering those allergies and how will this cold, wet forecast impact them? Well, we sort of had two things going on. So like the first outdoor allergen is out there and that's called outdoor mold. So that is a common allergen on the prairies. So soon after the snow melts, um, what we call snow mold is an allergen for some people. And so they may start uh, or probably have already started having symptoms and they may have started having symptoms even earlier. If you remember, I think it was like you know, late January, early February when we had that melt. So some people were already starting to get symptomatic because uh, the mold spores were exposed. Uh, in addition, of course, we got all this dust that's in the air and the dust is an irritant. So it's not the immune system reacting against the dust to cause the symptoms. The, uh, the dust is... Uh, but the dust is an irritant, so it directly irritates any lining that it hits, be it the nose or the eyes or even the lungs. So in those people who have mold allergy, they've got uh, symptoms because of the mold, but then you've got all this, uh, this uh, dry dust uh, blown around. So you know, we, uh, the, the wet weather coming uh, will hopefully wash things and uh, so that it will have less of that dust. Um, and uh, and even you know the 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 dust on the roads, the dust on the on the grasses. So it might actually help things. I know we think of rain, of rain and damp and you know increasing mold, uh, but I think at this exact juncture it might be helpful because at least we won't have to deal with the dust. Are we seeing our allergy seasons shift at all? Are they starting earlier, later? What are we seeing now as that we start to deal with some of that climate change? Well, I guess, like I mentioned, uh, this year we had uh, a, you know, this, uh, this, this, this melt where I think some people were probably getting symptomatic with, uh, with mold and allergy. Um, and then, if, if, then if, it's, you know, it's, if the seasons lengthen, um, you know, some of my patients, it's, it is, some prefer it to be a long, slow season, meaning a long sort of uh, uh, slow start to spring. Others prefer that it's just you know, one bad week when everything is just pollinating and then it's better. So it's, uh, you know, depending on who you ask, you'll probably, you know, if you ask two people, you get three responses. Um, so the, how I guess with climate change, um, I can see the seasons, well, like we did this year, starting a, little, starting a bit sooner with the snow melt. Dr. Christina Kalasinski, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome, have a good evening. Still ahead, Riley Lechak is back for a last check on the forecast. We'll be back right after this.
Well, to start off your Wednesday, we are looking at a few scattered showers uh, throughout the Red River Valley. Uh, yes, tapering off as we get through the day tomorrow. Uh, plus two first thing in the morning. Could even see a couple of wet flurries in with that as well. Six degrees by noon. And yes, we'll see a few sunny breaks likely through the afternoon. More likely the further west you go in the province. Up to seven in Winnipeg. Southeast winds at 10 near freezing with uh, the risk of some showers, wet flurries through Thursday and Friday. And then we turn the page back to sunny skies for Saturday and Sunday. Temperatures rebounding to seven on Saturday. And we're looking at sunny 13s for Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. Well, we have seen, well, with the exception of today, a very <laughs> warm stretch of weather in Manitoba, Brittany. And that definitely had some people thinking about firing up the Barbie. Mm, and if you're a fan of the other Barbie, <laughs> tonight's Daily Lift is for you. This is barbecue sauce, an <laughs> unconventional mix of vegan mayo and barbecue sauce dyed pink with beetroot powder to achieve the shade of hot pink Barbie is known for. The collaboration between Heinz and Mattel commemorates Barbie's 65th hmm. anniversary. Now, it's only available in limited quantities in the UK and Spain for now, and there are rumors it could have a special pairing condiment called henchup. Two things I love, puns yes. and condiments. <laughs> kind of reminds me of that colored ketchup that was a thing. Back the colored, in the day. yeah. Yes. I used to, people used to put that on their mac and cheese. I could never. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite condiment? Uh, I'm a ketchup guy. Oh, I'm a mustard. Yes. <laughs> we pair very well together we then. <laughs> Hopefully, you stayed dry yes. and warm tonight, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a wonderful night. See ya.